Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, November 22nd, 529 a.m. Central Time. December corn futures down one at 469. January soybeans down 11 and a half at 1365 and three quarters. December Chicago wheat up five and a quarter at 560 and a quarter. December Kansas City wheat up four and a quarter at 620. December spring wheat down a quarter at 717 and a quarter. Let's start off with the U.S. acreage battle uh, for 24, which I believe has already begun. So chatter regarding 2024 U.S. acreage prospects continues to circulate. In this month's early baseline projection report, the USDA estimated 2024 U.S. corn plantings are 91 million versus 94.9 million in 2023. U.S. soybean plantings were estimated at 87 million versus 83.6 million in 2023. Some private groups have released similar estimates this week. The new the new cro new crop corn soybean ratio favors an increase in so in U.S. soybean plantings in the eyes of most analysts. So the Informa survey, which I think is now run by S&P, was out this week, and they've got corn acres at 91.35 for next year and soybeans at 87.15. So very, very similar numbers to what USDA threw out here a couple weeks ago. That makes sense to me. We should see a decline in corn acreage in the U.S. and an increase in soybean acres. If you look at the ratio, which I think traders and academics look at the ratio more so than farmers, but it favors maybe a slight increase in soybean acres. When you look at the uh, farm budgets, um, I've seen variable results uh, given current prices. Uh, in a lot of places, it still favors corn, but not nearly to the extent that it favored corn last year. So I am on board with the idea right now that next year we lose some corn acres versus 23. We pick up some soybean acres versus 23, and we kind of normalize to some extent with a 91-87 mix somewhere in that neighborhood but yeah make no mistake the acreage battle is very much underway uh, people are making decisions i'm seeing new 24 farm budgets um, on a weekly basis or even daily basis at this point so yeah it's ongoing and and i kind of agree with the uh i agree mostly with what usda said i agree mostly with what informa said um, this all makes sense to me i suppose more rain is expected to fall in Brazil this week. Since Sunday, many Brazilian soybean areas have seen half an inch to one and a half inches of rain. More scattered showers are expected through Saturday. The radar is mostly blank over Brazil here this morning. Next week's forecast looks drier than this week. Longer term forecasts indicate that a wet pattern may again emerge around December 2nd. We've had uh, some rain this week. This is a good map from Marcus Weather. I'll put their link in the YouTube description. Uh, observed rainfall stuff is really hard to find outside of the United States. They don't have the systems essentially that we have. So they've caught, you know, half an inch up to an inch across a lot of Brazil this week. Um, when you look at the seasonal stuff, if you guys are betting on Brazilian drought, and that's fine if you do, but you're very much betting against the uh, normal seasonal patterns in Brazil. Um, the wettest months of the year are... November, December, January, February, March. So if if they run into a drought, which is certainly possible, it's it's not what normally happens. What normally happens is your your May, June, July, August, September, those are the dry months. We're like in the wet season right now and it's been drier than normal. But yeah, you're you're betting against normal seasonals if you're betting on drought. Some of the extended stuff says that we uh shift wetter after December 1st, but you've got to take long-term weather forecasts uh with a grain of salt, of course. So if you guys have not already checked out our premium content, you need to do so. You're not going to find content like this anywhere else. Joe, can you tell me about the video you put together yesterday? So yesterday I made a, li a video with a list of things that I hate. And then after I've recorded it, I said, you know what? Thanksgiving's Thursday. I probably should have done like things that I like <laughs> or I'm thankful for. But these are things that I hate. Uh, the top of the list was accumulators. Uh, number two was reowning sales. I didn't just say what I hate. I went through and I talked about why. I hate these things. There were like seven or eight things on the list. I actually got a lot of positive feedback on this one. If you guys want to see the premium stuff, go to standardgrain.com this morning. You can sign up. It's a $50 per month subscription. I'll send you over a copy of this morning's email, which includes the six most recent premium videos. This is the best way to support what we're doing here, guys. This is independent media. This is the only way we're able to do this is through premium subscriptions. Uh, the podcast pays us nothing. YouTube pays us enough to keep the lights on. So um, check it out. We'll send you a ton of info. You can cancel at any time. No other fee, no other obligation. Nobody will try to sell you anything else. I promise I'll shoot you over a copy of this morning's email if you uh, sign up this morning.
Another carbon capture pipeline has been denied. Wolf Carbon Solutions is withdrawing its request for an Illinois permit to construct a carbon capture pipeline. The pipeline would have carried up to 12 million tons of carbon annually to a storage site in the state. The carbon would have originated from two ADM plants in Iowa. Wolf's permit application was denied since the company did not have a formal agreement with ADM. Wolf's withdrawal comes after Navigator CO2 Ventures canceled its pipeline project and Summit Carbon Solutions had its pipeline permit denied. The company does plan to refile early here this next year. So they were going to pipe some carbon essentially from East Central Iowa down to Decatur. This isn't over. They're going to refile. Um, ADM said that they're still in conversations with Wolf. This is very much a, as far as farmers are concerned, it's a land rights issue. People uh, don't want this in their backyard. It's an eminent domain thing. At the same time, the uh, the the carbon capture people, they'll tell you that, you know, if we want this sustainable aviation fuel to work, we want all this to work, we're going to need carbon capture. That's, that's what they'll say. Um, we had a really great video uh, about this a couple of weeks ago. Steve Hess, who's a farmer in Illinois, um, they were going to put the Navigator pipeline in his backyard, essentially, and he came out and talked. <laughs> Uh, with me ab about that and about how he fought back against it. Um, he didn't want the easement. He didn't want this thing that's backyard. There's, there's a lot of uh, danger and safety issues associated with this. Um, it was a really, really great like down to earth conversation and kind of a farmer's pr perspective on uh, carbon pipelines. So yeah, this wolf thing isn't done. It's just done for right now, I think. Brazil's uh, largest fuel distributor, Vibra Energia, is working to expand corn-based ethanol sales in Brazil's northern states, which rely heavily on fossil fuels. Increased corn production in Brazil's northern region has led to a surge in investments in new biofuel producing facilities. Vibra is also looking to invest in sustainable aviation fuel made from palm oil. The company believes SAF could eventually become an export commodity in Brazil. Uh, ethanol in Brazil is not new. They've been doing it for a long time, but it's been made from sugar primarily. And now they're starting to use corn a lot more and they're starting to move further north with this. So I would say, generally speaking, I mean, more demand for corn, whether it's U.S. corn or Brazilian corn is a positive. It'll take more corn off the global balance sheets, right? Um, they're doing a, a couple of different things here. They're talking about um, sustainable aviation fuel. This company, which runs 8,400 gas stations, I imagine that's pretty substantial in Brazil. They signed an agreement last year to sell uh, sustainable aviation fuel to some big company in 2025. So this is good. I mean, it's I'm gonna say it's a short term issue that's going to impact the market, but big picture. Um, and we've got the wrong graphic up here. That's my fault. Um, here it is. Uh, but yeah, big picture. It's, it's helpful. All right, we'll get to EVs. So electric vehicle production is facing new challenges. A sharp decline in the cost of metals needed for EV batteries has mining companies either halting or postponing operations. As a result, the production of EVs could falter in the coming years. During the third quarter, EVs accounted for 8% of all new U.S. auto, auto sales here in the U.S., the Biden administration would like half of all new vehicle sales uh, to be electric by 2030, quite a goal. The administration recently made available $3.5 billion to increase the production of batteries and battery materials to promote the development of EVs. This kind of goes back, didn't we have an article, was it yesterday or two days ago about ESG and how like a lot of those investments were just not working out. I think those fall, this falls along the same lines. Demand for electric vehicles has really slowed down. It's like whoever wanted them, bought them and paid up for them like post COVID. And now it's like, if you wanted one, you got one. And it seems like the inventory is up. Ford lost a whole bunch of money uh, trying to sell these electric F-150s. Um, Tesla's are, are really down in price and now the companies aren't making money. I think some of the auto manufacturers have backtracked a little bit on these uh, like ambitious plans. I know that they're still floating out there, but I don't know. This is a fluid, it's very much a fluid situation. According to the Fed's minutes from their recent meeting, the committee will proceed carefully with future rate hikes while considering future economic data. Officials noted that further rate hikes may be necessary if inflation's downward trend would happen to stop. Rates will remain elevated until there is an apparent decline in inflation toward, toward the Fed's 2% goal. Investors are not anticipating more rate hikes. However, back in its September forecast, the Fed had one more hike planned before the end of the year. So rates have come down, still much higher than they were. Um, here's a chart of the two year. So you had your zero interest rate period uh, post COVID and then rates spiked. Uh, Yield on the two-year peaked in October at five and a quarter, and now we're down to like 4.88. Uh, 
when you look at what the treasury markets expect as it relates to interest rates, um, there is a greater than 50% chance that the Fed is cutting uh, in their May meeting and, and a, a smaller chance that they cut in March. So the trade seems to be uh, of the opinion that the Fed will in fact cut first or second quarter next year. Uh, to what extent? Nobody really knows. And we don't even know if this is factual. I mean, economic data could change and, and this could influence and, and this whole situation could change very quickly. And this is a huge deal for a lot of you guys because farming is expensive and a lot of you guys borrow a lot of money. What did uh, cattle do yesterday? Cattle futures were down on Tuesday. Live cattle futures closed an average of 33 cents lower. Uh, feeder cattle futures closed an average of 94 cents lower. Choice box beef was six cents higher yesterday afternoon, closing at 295.81. Select was 218 lower, ending the day at 268.77. Hey guys, quick housekeeping note. We are taking the day off Friday. No podcast, no videos, no emails. We need a day off. We'll be back at it Monday. Outside markets this morning, US dollars up a little bit. Stocks are mixed. Bonds are higher. Crude oil is down 96 cents in the January WTI at 76.81. Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we will talk to you next